This is Reverend Mike Capo with my sermon for Pentecost. I've been thinking lately about expectations. We usually enter a day or an event with some sense of what kind of day it's going to be. Are we looking forward to it, dreading it? Mostly, I guess we just expect it to be another regular day. And then once in a while, something horrible happens. And similarly, once in a while, something really wonderful happens. You might run into an old friend or go to a concert that was better than you were expecting. One of your children surprises you with a visit. By the time of the book of Acts chapter two, the apostles and disciples of Jesus have been on a roller coaster. The horrible events of Good Friday with Jesus arrest, trial and crucifixion were worse than anything they could have imagined. Then there was the shocking joy of his resurrection. It was so good they could hardly believe it. And then the risen Christ spent 40 days with them speaking about the kingdom of God. Just when they were hoping that that wonderful part would go on forever, he announces that he's leaving them and going up to heaven. Some of them are still looking for a regime change where the Romans are kicked out. They're disappointed it doesn't happen. He tells them to wait. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they wait and wait some more. Will this thing ever happen? I'm so bored waiting yesterday and I'm going to wait tomorrow. And then suddenly the day comes. I read from Acts chapter two, starting at verse one. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what looked to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked. Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that all of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own languages. It was the gift of communication, ultimately the gift of community. People who were separated suddenly began to understand each other. It may be the reversal of the curse of the Tower of Babel from Genesis. For the crowd, as well as the disciples, it was a moment of surprising joy, a day that exceeds expectations. However, feeling joyful about something wonderful and mysterious does not cause you to know what it means. And so there are two reactions. Some are sincerely curious. Verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? And then there were the jokers in verse 13 who made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. <laughs> in other words, they accused the disciples of being drunk. Well, now comes Peter's moment in verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. He then goes on to use scripture to explain what is happening. This, he says, is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
even on my servants, both young and old. Excuse me, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. By quoting Joel's prophecy, Peter is highlighting the significance of the moment and asserting that this is a fulfillment of God's plan. He is explaining that the events they are witnessing are a part of God's redemptive work and the inauguration of the promised messianic age. He then turns to recent events and goes right to the start of the matter. He starts talking about Jesus. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then in verse 25, Peter builds his case by quoting another scripture, Psalm 16, 8 through 11. David said about him, Jesus, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter then explains what he means quoting that psalm. Verse 29, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch, King David, died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. What Peter's saying is that David knew what was going to happen with Jesus. He had a vision of it well in advance. And at verse 32, Peter inserts a crucial piece of personal testimony, explaining that what they had all experienced after Jesus' resurrection. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. And then he jumps to Psalm 110, a favorite of the early church. Again, quoting, he says, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So a bit of a logic problem. All right. David, the king, the most powerful human being in, in relationship with God, um, says to his Lord, that's God, but then he quotes, this is the Lord said to my Lord. So who's this other person who's also David's Lord, but David's the king? Well, it's Jesus, his descendant who will be on his throne. And um, that, was, uh, that was a favorite one from the early church to start to talk about how Jesus was greater than David or, frankly, anybody else. First, we now come to the punchline where Peter hammers home the most crucial point of all. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. This is the first Christian confession. Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph and Mary's boy, was also the promise, God's promised Messiah, our Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But that is not all. He is also our Lord, 
the one whom we will follow and serve. We accept the Lord of all as the personal Lord of our lives. That is exactly what happens in verse 37, as those who hear Peter are horrified at their own complicity in murdering the long-awaited Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. That phrase, cut to the heart, is probably the best description of repentance anywhere in Scripture. What to do? Formalize your repentance by being baptized, so you will, in a sense, die and be raised with Christ. You know, nobody hearing this sermon today was there in Jerusalem shouting for Jesus to be crucified, but we found plenty of ways to sin in our own lives. And we too can repent of those sins and be baptized or remember our baptism, how we figuratively died and were raised with Christ our Savior. Because what happened in the Pentecost of Acts chapter 2 was not only for them. One of the beautiful, most beautiful sentences of Scripture is from verse 39. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I continue with verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. It's a great start for the brand new hot off the presses Christian church, 3,000 members. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The final verses describe the kind of life they shared together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, communion, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke their bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. My friends, that's the, the good news, the story of Pentecost, taken pretty much straight from Acts chapter 2 with a few of my comments thrown in. Um, I commend it to you as a good story, as your story. Um, and I hope this is the only sermon of mine you ever hear, or if you've heard many, that um, you may find yourself being drawn closer by that promise that is for you also. Um, if there's ever any way I can be helpful, be sure to contact me. Uh, we also have a dial-in Bible study on Wednesday as we're doing Luke right now. I think we're going to go right into Acts after that. So if you think Acts is an interesting and wonderful book, which it is, uh, we'd be happy to have you join us. Just get in touch. God bless.